Let's get to our star this evening, Will Alexander. He set the record as the youngest handler in Canada to achieve number one dog all breeds. That's a pretty big accomplishment. Mm -hmm. He's one out of only five handlers who've shown more than one top dog all breeds in Canada. He was the handler of the 2015 Best in Show winner, Beagle Miss P. And he is also an avid teacher and entrepreneur. Bill, uh, Will has many, many different businesses that uh, maybe we'll get a chance to tell you about all of the amazing things he has to offer. But for right now, I would like to just start by uh, learning a little bit more about Will. So hello, Will. Hi, everybody. How is everybody tonight? Good to see you all there. <laughs> I would love to know how you got started in showing dogs. Well, I got started. My parents bred Irish setters. And I, I, we bought our first Irish setter. I was about five, I think, we bought our first Irish setter. And she wasn't very good quality, but she was passable. And we started going to shows and she was getting hammered. She couldn't win anything. So we actually ended up buying a dog out of the newspaper. And he was advertised as half a champion. And uh, we, we bought him and he was this big hairy red dog. And we had a, a professional handler groom him for us, but my dad showed him. And his very first show, he won the group from the classes, group first from the classes. And, uh, and there was about 40 Irish setters in the, in the breed ring that, year, that day. And I, my, my dad got a picture. And the next day he went fourth in the open dog class and he got a picture again. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't know what he was doing but after that we it just evolved from there I started watching dogs and and I had a few heroes growing up um, George Alston and Brian Taylor were both very prominent Irish setter handlers and that's how I got the bug really um, I got to watch George and, and and whenever I was in the states I watched George and whenever I was at home I watched Brian Taylor and they were both I thought they were rock stars as far as I was concerned I saw them and they had the most beautiful dogs. In my eyes back then, Iris Setters were the most beautiful dogs. So I started at that level and I'm, my parents got to know a lot of the very big breeders. And there was a very famous breeder in Middleburg, Virginia named Ted Eldridge, um, Travelled Iris Setters. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that anymore. They're, they're long gone, but they were very famous Iris Setters. And when I was about, uh, I guess around 10, I went to visit Mr. Eldridge with my parents to look at a dog and they ended up giving me an English cocker that Mrs. Eldridge bred. And after that, I started visiting them every year. I would go every year to Middleburg, Virginia, and I would do the, the, the what's the, especially it was the Potomac Harvest Center, especially in Virginia. And um, Old Dominion was my favorite show. I was at the Cherry Blossom Circuit with Mr. Eldridge and, and Mr. Eldridge's handlers back then were Mike Billings and, and George Alston. So I got to see every, I, my very first, I met Mike and Janie and Bob and Ted Young when I was like 10 years old. I met them at a professional handlers association party with Mr. Eldridge. And I didn't, I didn't know any of them except for George. So, but I, I think back now and I, I got to meet some of the real icons of the sport when I was that age. So I went from there and I showed dogs in Canada and then I started, I worked for handlers starting around 16 or 17. And I worked for a handler named Gary McDonald. I worked for Brian Taylor and I worked for Bobby Stebbins down there. And I hung out with, I bothered that I bothered George all the time. I called all the time and I'm sure he was, he's, he was very nice about it, but it, I'm sure in his, in his inside voice, he was saying, what is this crazy Canadian kid doing? But, he would answer any question I had and he still does. I, I talked to him last week, he still answers questions I have. And he's the one that actually taught me to teach people how to show dogs. He, I, I would go to his seminars and, and he would teach me how to be a teacher. And it went from there. I went on my own probably in 1986. I went on my own because my, my boss at that point, uh, Gary McDonald, he passed away tragically in a house fire. So the next weekend I was, the handler, I had to show the dogs. And um, it went from there. We, we showed an Irish setter named Impresario in 87, and he was top dog, all breed, and I was 22 years old at that point. And it, it just kept coming from there. We'd, it seemed almost like it was um, written down somewhere. It, it, my, it just, it, my career just kept 
catapulting till I ended up going to Best in Show at Westminster. It was, and then after that, I, I kind of slowed down a bit and showed some dogs and, and started actually lean more towards the, the teaching of it. So I enjoy teaching. That's, that's amazing. That's Cole's notes. <laughs> wow. I mean, 22. I mean, most, uh, a, a lot of people are just starting to have the dream. Um, I know. It's many. crazy. I think back now, I have a, I have a 27 year old son and I think he, I think he's really mature, but when I was 22, I already had a, I, I was at 23, I had a mortgage and I had <laughs> this it was crazy. You know, I can believe so how fast these went. So what do you attribute to your success, to being so successful? And, you know, in all fairness, you could have been a one hit wonder, but you've done it five times. Yeah, I was top dog all breed four or five times, I forget. Um, yeah, three hours, no, four times. Three hour setters in an Afghan. Three in, okay. Yeah, and, and all the hour setters, the, the, actually the final hour setter, his name was, um, Piper, DeWitt's great one. He was grandsired by the other two Irish setters who were top dog over that I showed. So, and and he, he won 101 best in shows. His one was in Detroit, Cobo Hall. So it was, uh, he was a pretty fun dog. Um, so you were actually gonna tell these kids that it was just luck. You just happened to be in the right place in the right time. Is, is <laughs> no, that what you're gonna no. say? I think, I think timing does have a lot to do with it because I met the right people. And they and I I was like a sponge. I don't know, Kelly. Do you remember Garrett Lambert? No, I don't. Now, Garrett was a very successful handler here in Canada. He worked for Bill Trainer, and he came up here and he settled down up here, obviously. And I used to bug him to no end. I I would call him all hours asking him questions, and I think that was my my secret was I just was like a sponge and you'd go into my grooming room and there would be pictures of all these famous dogs and and I would draw on them as to where I wanted to trim them or where I would change things and and I would call George up and I'd say how did you do this how did you do that and I was I just always spun well there was we had shows we had bench shows in Canada and I don't know if you guys know what bench shows are bench shows you have to arrive, not you, Kelly. <laughs> you guys have to, you have to arrive at a certain time. You can't leave until, I think we couldn't leave till after mission show at seven, like seven o'clock each day. And we had a week straight of those shows. And we would have, um, this was, was a sportsman show in Canada. And Peter Green would be there. Bobby Barlow would be there. Tommy Glasser would be there. George Ward would be, would be there. And these guys couldn't go anywhere. So they just stood around talking. And I was the little guy wandering around listening to them all and bugging them all. So I got to know them all when I was a little kid. So I'm going to say the cliff note version for the juniors here are, it's okay to pester handlers, ask lots of questions, be eager to learn, be persistent. Yeah. Um, and, and then also aligning yourself with good knowledgeable people because you had great people guiding you. Um, in many ways, you were lucky you fell into it, but there were there there are people that could be in that position and not have taken advantage of it, and you oh, really no question. Yeah. capitalized mm -hmm. on those great was, influences. I think it was because it's what I always wanted to do. Like I, I think when I when I I did I did retire a couple of years ago because I had a bad hip, and I'm I'm actually come back to show a few dogs. But someone asked me, um, what kept me going, and it and it was I. I I just wanted to get better and better all the time. Even when I was in my forties, I would see somebody and, and think, ah, oh, and I would ask them the question. It was just nonstop questions over and over again. And I always considered myself, I was interviewed one time and I considered myself the luckiest person I was around because when I was 10, I wanted to be a professional handler. So when I grew up, I was a professional handler. So I got to do what I wanted to do. Like some people want to be astronauts and be, baseball players and they don't they don't achieve it and I got to do what I wanted to do so so speaking of living the dream um can you maybe describe for us the day that you showed Miss P like approaching Westminster what were your thoughts coming into Westminster what was it like in the breed in the group and then um you know maybe even best in show if you could just tell us that story because you know, there's so much that goes into that win. Oh, for sure. Well, she, uh, she had been, she was the first dog I ever campaigned in America. 
I had shown up for circuits and 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 gone home. But she was the first dog I ever showed all year long, and she ended up top hound, and she won the what I guess they don't call it the Quaker Oats anymore. They forget what they call it now. Um, so she had, it was a very exciting year, and Westminster was going to be your last show, no matter what. And coming up to it, any of those big shows where you think you have a chance to do well, things always start to go wrong, or you overthink things, and. One day, I remember I, I was coming. It was we had the specialties, the setter specialties, right before the garden, and I had Miss P with me because she never left any, didn't, never left my side basically. But she was lame for two days, three days before the garden. I couldn't get her sound. She was so reckless, and she would play with the big dogs, and she always hurt her shoulder, and I was freaking out. So by the time the garden came, I had my girls that were working for it. They, they would, they would carrier and lots of crate time and she was so used to a regimented exercise that she was getting pent up where she was not herself because she's usually even at dog shows I would I would either I would walk her forever or the girls would walk her just to stretch her out and she was not getting that because I was so worried about her shoulder but the shoulder was fine and she she uh the day before the garden she seemed fine I would but I was still panicking everybody that I was I was at her specialties were all trying to talk me off a ledge, so to speak. And then the day of the garden, I took her in the breed ring and it was, um, Adam, Alan Oden was doing it. And she was showing pretty well, but Alan had never really done much for her. So I wasn't really convinced about the breed. And actually, and she had, Alan put a dog ahead of her and was about to take them around and say best of variety. And he changed his mind and said, I want to see these two go around together by themselves again. And then she ended up being victorious, but she was this close to losing the braid that year. Like I, I, I would thought we were losing. He said, put this bitch up front. Let's have the class round. I thought, well, that's it. Pack your stuff, guys. Let's go home. So, and then we had, um, Betty Ann was doing the group and she had always been a big fan, but I hadn't shown to her a lot. So I wasn't sure because the bloodhound was very popular that year as well. And she had done well for that dog and he'd gone back and forth. When we won that group, Adam Bernardin, who was, my assistant for eight years, he was so excited. And we just talked, I used to always say to him, no mistakes, no mistakes. Make sure if you're going to make a mistake, make it in your head. So I always made my, my assistants or my students replay or, or play out the class in their head before they go in the class themselves. And I always said, if you're going to make a mistake, make it in your head. So when you walk in the ring, you've already made the mistake, you're not going to make it. So all day long, Adam was saying, no mistakes, no mistakes, no mistakes. And then, and uh, we were in the holding area for best in show, and oh, I, I missed a story. After the group win, I was walking into where they they interview after the group, and um, Sue Forsythe yelled at me, and she said I had to call mom, and I so I called Janie, and she yelled at me and told me I went too fast down the back, <laughs> and then George the same thing. George called me and told me that I wasn't thinking on my feet and I was going too fast, so. <laughs> they were probably right when I watched the video I think oh yeah maybe I did hurry myself a little much but then the next day we I told Adam I said no mistakes we worked on no mistakes no mistakes and and it just seemed to work out for us I, I slowed myself down in my head I was, George always taught me to think in slow motion when I was in the ring to go half speed and, and it really does work it really if you take your speed and cut it in half because of your adrenaline it's probably the right speed that's what I've always done. That's what I've always taught too. That's that interesting. I mean, really interesting lessons there. I, I love the idea of practicing it in your head. So by the time you get in the ring, it's not your first time. You've done it over and over and over. And there's almost a pattern now that's been established. So you know how much driving we do, Kelly. And I would do that when I was driving. I would play out classes in my head while I was driving. And I remember the first national with Beagles I ever won was 1992. And I remember winning that national driving home from a dog show in Canada because I played it out in my head. <laughs> what I was going to do. And <laughs> this seemed to work out for her. Well, and you know, and I love that, you know, here 20 years, maybe 30 years after you started, you're still practicing in your head. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, you don't get to a certain place in this world and you just become complacent and you don't have to keep working. You know, you're, you, you were become complacent. Someone's going to beat you. 
<laughs> and and I always tell people when I when I teach my classes that even as owner handlers, when you walk in that ring, the, the professional handlers are not going to let you in. So you cannot make a mistake. You have to go out there, and they they're hoping you're going to make a mistake because that's when they have it on you, in so to speak. And it's not just professional handlers. Really good breeder owner handlers are the same way. So you, when you're in there as a owner handler, brand new, even a junior handler. I always tell my, my students, watch everybody in your ring, watch what they do, watch so you know what they're doing and see what mistakes they're doing or what mistakes they're not doing. So you have a blueprint when it's your turn up there. So you find, so I see so many people that will sit and be chatting during the whole class. And I, I think you lose part of that, part of that edge if you're chatting and miss, you miss things, you, know, you really do. It's, a, it's amazing what you miss when you're chatting and, and even to the point of just how how some judges seem to like you to bring the dog back to them some like the side some like the front they're not going to tell you most of the time so you need to watch and find out what they want i used to always make a, a, a make a point of going to class before so i had an idea of what they wanted as well so yeah that's great great four more is four armed as far as i'm concerned yes <laughs> yeah, so I like to be very prepared too, so I can have a bit of a neurotic mind, but you know, all my ducks in a row and I am capable of improvising, but if I don't have to, I want to, I want to play. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so, um, so what was it like after winning? You, you know, you, uh, you see the Westminster winner, they have to go on all these TV shows. How did that feel like being this dog handler to now you're on national TV? What was that like? It was exhausting. Like I, I made Adam come with me because I was so tired because they made us stay at the after show party till like two o'clock in the morning. And then uh, they met us at the, at the hotel at like four thirty five 5 o'clock to make all those morning shows. So I was exhausted. And, and um, so Adam came with me to keep, he looked after P while they interviewed me. And, and actually at one point I went down the truck and had a nap because I was so tired, but it, it, was, it was, it was something I never forget. But, but to tell you, honestly, I, I do forget some of the shows. I've had to go back to YouTube and watch some of them, see where we were. And I've only ever watched the garden tape itself, the whole entirety once, so. Wow. Yeah, I don't like watching myself. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe someday you'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll want to do that. You know, right now you're probably still winding down because being a life of a handler is quite the adrenaline rush there's not yeah. not much downtime which which actually leads me into my next question um you know being an all breed handler can you tell me about the life of an all breed handler and and what your life looked like when you were campaigning a top dog like what were your weekdays like what was the weekend like oh and we gotta remember everybody that, that these are animals and they they don't get a day off like you you are with them all the time and i i had girls work me and staff and whatnot but i tried to use mondays as the day i got back to everybody but other than that we were working with the dogs every day and when you're campaigning a dog you probably know too kelly you start to you start to think too far ahead and you overthink things and, and you worry about you, you feel like you have to you have to keep winning and keep winning and keep winning and it's, it's true, like when you, people have a lot invested in the dog and you, so you've got to do the very best you can. So you are almost overthinking where you're going and what you're doing. And we were very regimented. I, I felt that structure was the best thing for the dogs and for the staff, if they had certain days where they had to. I, I had, usually I had three staff members at the kennel that were on the road with me. And I would, I would always have one, they, they didn't have to do the same job over and over again. So one day, one would treadmill the dogs, the other one would, would be doing, if they were in bands, redoing bands and redoing, washing out pee for furnishings. And the other one would be doing more maintenance. Then they would all switch the next day, just so that they didn't get in a rut. And it worked out well, because I, I found that they never got bored of what they were doing. And um, they were great too, like they were, I, I don't know how, they were tireless it seemed like i had some very good assistance even young adam adam would work until he dropped like it was it was i had some really good kids really good kids so at what age would you at what age or what experience level do would you be willing to start working with 
the junior? What are your expectations and when are you open to? Um, well, usually, yeah, usually 16 was the age I started them at, but there were some that just started hanging around the, the setup when they were younger, um, like, like Ashley Martins and Jordan, and they, there were other girls that would just come in and start sweeping up and tidying up. And then they eventually just became part of the team. They did it all themselves too. Like I never asked them to come and do it. They came and asked me if they could do it. And, and I think that's, that, that's such a great initiative. You know, I, and Adam came to me when he was 14, he was having issues at home and he, he came and lived with me and went, I knew his sister very well. And he came and lived with me and went to school and I made sure he went to school and I almost, he almost became my adopted son and he, he was, he was nonstop working. Now he made mistakes. Like <laughs> he, he would, he would overwork sometimes and overthink things and, and he would, he would make mistakes. And I remember coming home one time and getting a call that I was at a restaurant and I'd stopped to have dinner. And he, I got a call saying that my beagle and my smooth fox terrier were loose somewhere and I, I lived in the woods at that point <laughs> and I got home and there was the snow was I had like at least three feet of snow and I could tell that there were tracks all the way around the house but these two dogs had circled the house and Adam hadn't noticed because he was eating pizza and playing video games or something <laughs> I just went outside and I banged two dishes together and when a bee goes loose and they hear dishes being banged together they tend to head towards the dishes and the smooth just followed. And it was the beagle bitch I just won the Brie of the Garden with that <sighs> year. So that was that was probably March of 95 or so around there. <laughs> no, maybe it was after that because Adam came in 98. So it was definitely after that. So it was probably 2002, that bitch, the Jody bitch. Yeah, so yeah, she'd won the Brie of the Garden and she was, I get a message that she's loose on the property somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's, that's pretty scary. Yeah, pretty it is. Scary. Your stomach kind of drops. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, a, a junior, if a junior came to work for you, when, when someone first starts working for you, what are their <laughs> job roles? Oh, we start off slow. They start off with um, Xing the dogs and cleaning up and, and, and putting away the cleaning up the setup and putting away the tools and putting, things like that. And ring, running rings, letting me know what's happening in the rings when they become full-time that's when they start to progress um i start i start teaching them how to groom dogs when i start seeing that they have the initiative that they want to do it uh, they usually tell me it, it was funny uh, i keep i keep bugging on adam but adam would it was like adam was stuck to my shoulder when i was trimming dogs almost to the point i had to tell him to back off <laughs> but he was so I, I had these, my washer and dryer were in my grooming room. So everybody sat on the washer and dryer while I trimmed and I would yell and talk, tell them what I was doing and blah, blah, blah. Um, showing dogs in Canada, we have a bit of an edge because we're allowed to practice in rings in Canada. So every morning I would take the kids into the ring and, and they would work with a different dog. Cause I always said, what if I get stuck and you have to go in the Bouvier ring or you have to go in this ring, you need to know how to show them. I don't want you just walking in there and hoping for the best I always try to teach things when you do something do it on purpose like I when I when I watch people bait dogs and they come in and they, and they hope it works I said I don't want it to I don't want you to hope it works I want you to make it work so do it on purpose and that's how I I would do this every morning with them and sometimes after the show too if they were still wanting to do it but usually mornings because we'd get there at what, 536 and then once things were settled if we had time before the morning rush we'd go and do 10 minutes in the ring i think it really helped you know with, with the dogs as well like we had some dogs that weren't being shown yet that i would play dog show with six months before they were being shown and it, it really helped you know. and do you think this make it happen do you think that that's a, a mindset that you know what a, a, just a level of like your all your energy and conviction is in that that yeah. that's what makes the difference i want things to be like i said i want things if you're gonna if you're gonna do something do it on purpose i don't want you just to fumble into it i want you to if you're not sure about it ask me about it but i want when you when you walk into that ring i want you to pick your spot where you're sending your dog up i want you to pick that piece of property on purpose 
not, not necessarily because it's you trapped in the corner, but this is your piece for the next 30 seconds while the judge walks by your dog, even when the initial stop. And George always taught me that you, you, as soon as you walked in that ring, you had to have eyes in the back of your head. You had to see everything that was happening. And he wanted you to do things on purpose. He, if he saw me waltz into the ring like I had no care in the world, he would ream me out, trust me. You had to walk in there like you were supposed to be the one that was going to win that class. So, and what if you don't feel that way? How do you, like if you're a shy kid or lacking in confidence, yeah. how, well, how I, do you? Yeah, I, I, well, we all, get, like, I think I started off as a shy kid. I think it just, you just gain confidence by, I think dog shows are a great environment for that type of thing because we accept anyone and even, and shy kids can ask questions of anybody. Um, you remember dog shows are the only sport where the for the price of an entry fee you can compete with a professional this is the only place in the world you can you can't do it in golf you can't do it in hockey you can't do it in tennis you've got mm -hmm. you can you're right there with a professional so you use them to your advantage ask them questions and and i, I always chose i always when you chose it your mentor I, I called I, have a, I had a book that i wrote and i called that section standing on the shoulders of giants so when you when you pick that person, make sure they have big shoulders and pick the right mentor. A lot of people will be your, will want to be your mentor, but you choose your mentor. You choose who's right for you um, and choose one that has big shoulders. Like, because they've got 30 years experience and the person they learn from has 30 years experience and, and so on and so on. So you choose the right mentor. You've got a hundred years of experience right in that person. It's important to, to think these things through. Well, and I like that suggestion as well, because we, you know, someone that resonates with you that you feel like you can relate to, because there are a lot of great handlers out there, but you need to have one that you feel comfortable right, with. Right, right, exactly. So and, and you get along with you. You don't necessarily, like, I think you want to be friends, but I've had some assistants that we weren't that close, but they were great assistants and they were such good students, but after they left, we never really socialized. Like I have some that never leave me, <laughs> but. So those big shoulders, that's why. <laughs> so when, when you were a kid and you were pestering these handlers, what were some of the questions you were asking them? Uh, a lot of it was, a lot of it was presentation in certain breeds. When I worked for Bobby Stebbins, he was great at this. He would, we'd do our, our schedule up and whenever he saw a break in the schedule, he would look to see what were happening, what breeds were being shown during our break. And he would make me go watch Gene Blake show an Afghan or George show the Irish Setter, or like he made me go do, he would, he would pick out these handlers and he made me go watch them. And I'm telling you, you learn so much by choosing these people and watching them and see what they do. And, and like Janie, if you want, I, I didn't get to see Janie show a lot because I was pretty young. But it's, it's like she, every move was choreographed. Well, she knew exactly what she was doing every time. And it's, it's exciting to watch when you see a handler do that. You know, there, it's not, and it wasn't choreographed. It came naturally to her, but it just seemed that way. Everything was so smooth and there was no panic in her. And I'm sure no matter who we are, we do panic at some point. Um, and there's an adrenaline story about you know, when your adrenaline spikes and you become this superhuman strong strength person and then you, you start doing things too fast. And George, again, I'm going to talk about George. George does all this stuff in my head. He banged it all in my head when I was a kid. He told me that adrenaline, when your adrenaline spikes, it takes three seconds for it to come out of your breath and your dog smells it. And he says that dogs don't sense when you're nervous and they smell it. And he would always try to tell me to mask my, my breath with a candy. And even to this day, before I go in the ring, I, I have, we have these cough candies in Canada called Fisherman's Friends. I'm not sure if you have them down there, but they're, <laughs> they're disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> and I always have them in my pocket. People make fun of me because I always have them in my pocket. And I always take one before I show a dog. I, I, even, I do. It's just become a, a habit for me. And, and, I, and I hear George yelling at me if I don't do it. So. Well, it's good to hear again that that even someone such as yourself can still get nervous and have oh, an adrenaline. I think when you don't get nervous, you're not, you don't have that edge, so. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree. It's about being able to channel all of that. Right. I, I do want to encourage juniors, um, please put some questions in the chat box. Will is an all breed handler. He knows everything about so many different types of breeds. So if you have some questions, please put them up in the chat box and I will ask him. And if you want to you know, wait to the end to ask him yourself, that's fine too. But there's a great opportunity for you to be asking your own questions. Um, will, if you were judging junior showmanship, what would you be looking for in the ring? Uh, well, I do judge it up here. Uh, down there, you have to be licensed. But up here, we're allowed to, the show just asks the judge ahead of time, and it's usually a handler. And I like to, I like to see someone working hard with the dog. But I also like to see the, the I don't want to notice the handler as much. I want to see a, a good job but I want to see the, the handler almost disappear behind their dog without making a mistake. Um, I was, I was taught that from Garrett. I was taught because when I was younger, I was a bit of a ham and I would try to, you know, you get in there and your ego takes over and you think you have to do things, but Garrett would, would tell me, no, he'd say, ham it up, William, ham it up. And I knew that what he, I knew exactly what he was, he was saying to me to tell me to stop doing what I was doing. <laughs> so, and, and I just find that you'll, if, if you, Think about almost disappearing behind the dog. Your moves become smoother. Everything becomes smoother. You're not worrying about the crowd as much. You're just worrying about the animal you're trying to present. And like, like I said, anybody can show a dog. It takes a great, great talent to present a dog. And you have to learn how to present a dog. And that's, that's melding with the dog and becoming one with the dog, moving in timing with the dog. Everything's going to become, but it's, a, it's about the dog. You need to work with the dog. I like handlers that ask their dogs to do things, not tell them to do things. So I can see that when I'm judging juniors. Yeah, there's a big difference in that. There sure is, yeah. And, uh, and, and there is a time to tell them, but yes, the, it's amazing the handlers that their first, their, their, their first step is always to ask and to request. And there's a difference in how those dogs yeah. You know, there's um, now there are some dogs that you know they they I've had some dogs that I've shown that it's been strictly business between them and I and we've had to work that way um, but then I have other dogs that have become my best friends that sometimes took advantage of me out there because we were best friends you know? mm. so it's, it's a fine line sometimes so you mentioned that you look you like to look for a handler that melds with the dog how do you melt with the dog um well I just try my best to work off the dog. I try to, if the dog has certain habits, I try to work with those habits instead of trying to work against them. I, I remember a, a young handler in Canada, he had a very nice dog that he, he got from an American kennel. He, the dog had already won some best of shows down in America and he was, he was trying to change the dog. And he came out of the ring one day and he was so angry and he said, I've got to retrain this dog. And I said, no, he needs to retrain you because he knows exactly what he's doing and you're working against him. So, and, and he, he'll never admit it to this day, but things changed that day. He started winning and I could see he wasn't forcing the dog into doing things and the dog just performed himself. It, it seems like they do. Dogs all need a lot of, gu there's, there's guidance involved and direction, but if it looks easy, it's usually because the dog is being directed the right way and guided the right way without being forced. Like I've had some dogs where judges told me, oh, anybody could show this dog. And I'm like, oh yeah, take him and find out. But it's just because we had that connection and I knew, I knew what to expect from them and what they were going to do in certain situations and how they were going to handle this part of the crowd or how they're going to handle the examination. It's all these little things I think you need to learn about your dog, about each dog you're showing. It's, it's working with the dog, not working against the dog. Yeah, that's, that's great advice for sure. Um, Annie has a question. How did you decide to um, pursue showing dogs versus going to college? Was that a difficult decision for you? <laughs> well, I, I did try um, college for a while, and, and the, the dog shows just got in the way. And I had this one dog that I was doing quite well with as a youngster, and my parents helped pay for that dog's career and called it my tuition. And it, it really did work out well because that I learned so much from that dog. And 
I just, I, I just always wanted to be a handler. There was nothing really else I wanted to do. So it was, it was hard to try to move my, my direction somewhere else when I was always being drawn back to the dogs. Well, I think it's a great question and a very uh, personal decision. It for... really is. Like I would tell my kids, I have two boys and I would say, oh, school first. Yeah. Something to fall back on. And I think I, I learned a lot of in life school. Like I, like I have, I have my own shampoo company and I've, I've written a couple of books and I've got my online stuff. And I, so I think I've learned from people I've been around. So I think because of our world and the dog show, we're so, we have so much access to different individuals who do everything that you learn from all these individuals. It's amazing who is at the dog show from politicians to lawyers, to teachers, to doctors, you can learn anything you want from talking to these people. And I think, I think I was one of those people that just continuously ask questions all the time. Well, I will say from, from my perspective, I did pursue my degree and I did want to have that to fall back on. And of course that was the line of logic when I grew up. Oh, good luck. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I can, I can see both perspectives. And one thing I will say is being a professional dog handler, I actually feel I could be a CEO of any company. The skills that if you're good at what you do, I mean, you're a psychologist. Not only do you know how to psychologically work with a dog, you learn to work with all different types of personalities of people. It's part of your job. You learn how to fix your vehicle when it breaks down. You learn how to, you, you, you are a jack of all trades in many ways and very self-reliant. So there are so many life lessons um, that, that come with being a dog show handler that that's why, you know, it, you retired well, and here you are, you're, you're promoting products and, which I'd love to, to hear a little bit more about as well as what you're doing after, because I think one of the things that does come up and Tuni Conti is someone that I interviewed as well. And she said, absolutely. You go to college, you could be, you could get injured. You could, this is a very physical job. You have to have that college education, which I agree with. Um, but as I see with you, well, you have this, you know, this is like phase two and here you are, making a, a career where you're not handling dogs and you're doing it without a college education. Um, so college was definitely, we're definitely a stepping stone though for everything I've done. You know, so it's I worked hand in hand. And I think it was just, a, uh, I hate to say it, a dog just kept pulling me back in everything I do. Everything I do is somehow directly or indirectly because of dogs. I've been so very. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the programs that you have? Some of my juniors have checked out your virtual um, videos, and you have schools. Can you tell me a little bit about what you um, have to offer that maybe could appeal to some of the juniors? Sure, I have, a, I have a, a YouTube channel called Dog Show Tips, and right now I'm, I'm doing a lot of interviewing, but I also do a lot of lessons on that, and I do, I've done. Um, I think, I think right now there's about five or six lessons on YouTube where I've broken different aspects of the sport down from the free stack to the hard stack to moving your dog to tabling your dog. I've also done a, a bunch of grooming seminar webinars. I have a line of shampoo and conditioners out there. Um, I wrote a book in 19, no, 20. 13, I wrote a book called For the Love of Dogs. And it was just a story about a, a young person's pursuit in the sport of dogs. And it was, it went well up here. And it, it, it seems to go well in Europe too. Uh, I think there's some Irish Setter Clubs and whatnot that promoted it as well. I wrote that, I got the idea driving to Chicago International because we were talking amongst ourselves that there was not enough young people in our sport. So I thought, you know, I'm going to write this book about this young person that gets involved in the sport. And, and it, it was a lot of fun. Um, done a lot of articles. Um, I just tried to do everything I could educational wise, besides, besides the, the, obviously the shampoo and conditioners, but, but all my webinars and, and seminars, I, I do seminars. I haven't been doing them because of COVID, but I, I, for a while there, I was booked two and three a month 
across Canada and the States. And it was very busy. That was, that was going to be what I was going to do when I retire. But then when COVID came along, we've had to find something else to do. And a buddy of mine that has been helping me with dog show tips for about, you know, 10 or 15 years, we decided to start dog show tips with the interviews and the nonsensical ones, plus all the webinars that we did. We did a three-part webinar on showing dogs and that went over very well. We tend to run that every six months. Um, and I also have different breed webinars and individual webinar. I take, I've also done where I people have sent me um, videos of themselves showing their dogs and I will critique it and tell them what I think they should do and how to improve it in my opinion. I get a, a lot of Europeans from that. It's a lot of fun. It's very gratifying too. And I look down at my phone and there's a number there that is like way too long to be a North American number. And they, <laughs> and they thank me because they finished their, their boxer and they had never been to one class, but they, they learned through virtual. So yeah, it's, it's fun. I like hearing those things. I love hearing when someone succeeds and I've helped them along the way somewhere. Yeah, that's great. That's um, I, I think it's great to have all this virtual and even the the interviews that you're doing that that can give juniors or people new to this access to some of these great people that have come along and hear their stories. I was so worried about losing some of those stories, and we did lose some of those stories. So uh, actually, it was Eileen Kate, Eileen Hackett, and Kate that told me I should do this years ago. I should. They want me to write a book, but I think this worked out better. I think because I, I, I think you need to hear them. You need to hear these people's voices when they speak. Like I, even I, I have known so many of them for so long, and I'm dumbfounded with how, how what they tell me and what I've learned. Like I've learned so much interviewing them. It's, <laughs> it's been fabulous. That's a lot of fun. What would you recommend to people that are new to learning how to show dogs? Well, what would I recommend? How to write to a new person. How to begin? Well, I, I tell everybody that go to a dog show was the first first step for me before all this online stuff came on. I, I, I would tell them to go to a dog show and just sit and watch and see if it was actually for you because it, it's a microcosm of the real world in that dog show. And, and some people are overwhelmed by it and some people are, are sucked right in right away when they see it. They just love the atmosphere. And again... I think when you're there, you decide if you if you have a breed you're interested in, you start watching that breed and you'll start seeing who who dominates that breed. And that's the person you want to go talk to because you, you don't want to start. I don't want to say this. I don't want to come out the wrong way. You don't want to start at the bottom or in the middle. You want to learn from the best people you can possibly learn from, even when you're brand new. Um, now, obviously, baby steps because you are green walking in there. But again, that's how I, that's how I wrote. I, I wrote this this small pam, small handling guide called "Handle Your Way to a Paper Bag," and it, and it was this, the first one was learning your breed, but the second one was standing on the shoulders of giants, and that was choosing your mentor. And I think that's the most important part. I really do. Yeah, Choose I think right that's mentor. a yeah, that's a really great message. Um, is there anything else you would like to? add any questions that I haven't asked them because I will open this up to the juniors in just a minute. Any thoughts, Will? On oh, myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I think that the, the sport needs you young people to, to be interested and have initiative to move on because we're only as strong as, as our new people. So I, you, you new people have to I think, I think it's great that you want to be involved in the sport of dogs and learn what you can and be a sponge, learn to be a sponge. And I remember when I first started working for a handler, I, I, I'm sure it is unheard of nowadays, but I did it for free. I just wanted to go to the shows and work and I wanted to learn. And it's, it, it was that kind of initiative. Adam was the same way. Adam was just like a sponge. And it, that makes it as a handler and a teacher, Students like that make it seem all worthwhile. I remember my very favorite garden. This is even including the one we won. My very favorite garden was the year Adam won the sporting group with the Irish setter. Jody Paquette went third with her standard schnauzer. Jennifer McCall McClintock went fourth with their rolling the sheepdog. And Marlene Ness won Cockers that year over the black dog that Michael was showing those top dog all breed. 
and and by him do I hate to say it by by Marlene winning that variety it opened the door to to Adam winning the sporting group and all those kids worked for me so I was like in heaven watching that weekend so it was so much fun watching all these kids just succeed you know that is such a good feeling it it's I've found as I've interviewed my book what motivates certain handlers it's it can be very different what what motivates them and for me i love taking a raw dog and a dog that has some challenges and really watching it step into its best self and things that maybe i didn't even think it could overcome being able to see that dog overcome that and in many ways you with these these kids i mean you saw them when they were yet raw and young and not developed and you know wow what a feeling to see oh, them still standing. Fun. I, all, I, I still love following them following them even to this day i love watching them and i, I do follow them so that's that is back. great you wanted the, i was talking with uh sue Forsyth because i interviewed i'm interviewing her for to talk about jane in my book and she was talking about Jane and how much she would ride her help. She wanted them to be so much better because she wanted someone to compete against her. So she wanted them stronger because she wanted them to be better competitors because then she'd have to fight harder. Oh my God. And I you thought that me. was oh my gosh. just so much, you know, fun. I mean, there, there are people that just like to win and there are people that just really enjoy the competing and, and what that brings out in you. And Janie, whenever I saw her, she always, she always tried to teach me something. I don't know. Uh, it, it was, if I was doing something wrong, she taught me that I was doing it wrong. If I was doing something right, she would, she never would tell you, but she would pat you on the back a little bit. But those people are, are far and few between. She was an amazing competitor. I loved watching her show dogs. I remember watching her and George show Iris Setters one year. And I was captivated watching the two of them work out there. And George had worked for Janie a bit. So there, there was, it was interesting watching them work together. So. Yeah, that would be amazing too. But there's to a say. story. I was in the ring one time with Adam and we were at some IRS center specialty. And I was right. I was either behind him or ahead of my camera. We were not close enough that we could chat. And he said, he said, I can't show dogs when you're here because I can't do all my moves. I said, because they're my moves. <laughs> <laughs> so, Will, can you tell us some of the, the breeds that you show? We ha I have juniors that show several different breeds. We know that you specialize. Setters are really where you got your start, yeah. correct? But what are some of the other breeds that you... Uh, I've won best in shows in every group. Um, um, I, 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 I love showing standard poodles. I've shown the, I showed those for Linda Campbell for years and Allison and I were together. We showed, we ran the whole kennel for Darwin kennels and that was a lot of fun. I love showing poodles. I love showing French bulldogs. Um, I showed a lot of Cavaliers and Griffs, um, Terriers, Terriers weren't as strong in Canada, but I did show a lot of Airedales and, um, later on Border Terriers. And I, I loved showing the Airedales. I, I always, and I, there's another person I, I, when I first got my first Airedale, I bugged Bobby Fisher until he finally <laughs> answered my questions. So, and he was great that way too. And he didn't know me from anybody and he still answered my questions. I was just this young kid that kept bugging him. Um, working dogs, I showed a lot of boxers and, and um, oh, I showed herding dogs, Bouviers was normal, what I showed mostly, Bouviers and sheep dogs in, in, her, in the herding group. And the working group was mostly boxers. I showed a lot of boxers. Um, hound group, I, beagles and Afghans were my main two breeds. It was tough dog I'll breed in 2010 with an Afghan dog. And he was, he was like, a, he was so smart. He was like a person. You know, he was, it was so much fun to have, have him around. And then sporting dogs is, is my main, I, a lot of setters, a lot of spaniels. I grew up with Irish setters and English cocker spaniels, so. I, I consider myself a sporting dog handler first. Well, for sure, if kids have any questions when it comes to grooming, I'm hearing poodles and Afghans. So I think um, you're pretty well qualified if any grooming questions come up. <laughs> um, I have Amanda here, just wanted to know if you've ever shown a Saluki. Uh, yep, I showed for uh, Star White up here. I showed a bitch named um, Lucky and she won it. She was top 
no, number two hound up here. Oh, I love showing Salukis. And I used to get in trouble when I first started showing Salukis because I showed them a little too sporting dog-like and I maybe moved them a little too fast, but I figured it out. <laughs> so <laughs> I had watched Gene Blake enough and I figured it out. It's, it's fun though, you know, figuring out a new breed and trying oh, to. Fun, yeah. And I always try to find who I think is the best of that breed and go watch them and then see how they do it, what, what little nuances they have and what, it's amazing to watch them work. If someone that's a master at their craft, it's so fun to watch them work. You know, I enjoy it. Yeah. yeah. Even now, even now, I love to sit back and watch a good battle. I remember, I watched boxers a couple of years ago at, at um, Orlando, and Michael was showing his bitch. Then I get she was relatively new, and it was almost like he he just turned it on, and everybody else turned. It was just so fun to watch them all battle back and forth. And he wasn't going to be denied that day. And I watched, I, when he came out of the ring, I'm like, Mikey, that was exciting. <laughs> you know, let's uh, watch, watch that. It's, I, I actually do feel a little disappointed for some of the juniors coming up nowadays because the way the shows have developed, you don't have a concentration of outstanding handlers in a breed right. because, you know, most of us. Um, you know, if I'm campaigning a top Doberman, then another top Doberman handler isn't going to want to come show against me because they want to go somewhere else. But being able to see those top handlers, like you said, in boxers, and you have not one or two, but you have six or seven or eight of them all in the ring at the same time, like duking it out. Oh, it's so much fun. We had a very ring. famous uh, boxer handler up here in this in the 60s and 70s named Shirley DeBoer. I don't know if you remember that name. She was top dog all braid tears and roll with a, with a boxer up here. Well, one year, um, Jeannie was telling me the story. I didn't get to see it, but she said one of her most exciting years in the garden, it came down to her and Shirley because she said her and Shirley showed so similarly that the battle was back and forth. They would, they would play off each other. She said it was so much fun competing with Shirley. Shirley passed away since then, so I, but but um, it was fun to watch. I, I never got to see Shirley show that much, but Janie always told me how good she was. You know, that's great, and and I hope that these Snow you know, Juniors, being our future, can can hear this message of the camaraderie and how you can love showing against each other, and you know nobody likes to lose. No, um, exactly, there has to be that respect, and there has to be that camaraderie. And it'll be so much more fun if you have it, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's, I remember uh, Tooney was saying in one of her interviews that Mich Michelle Scott said, hey, if you won all the time, it wouldn't be that much fun now, would it? You'd get old, so. I don't know, some people do seem like they could just keep winning all the time and it doesn't get Oh yeah, time. and it seems like they are, but they're not really. <laughs> yeah, we all, we all like to, you know, <laughs> challenge like that. Yeah. I, um, and I have a couple, oh, we have to, the juniors just have a couple of questions about breeds. Have you shown Britneys and Weimaranas? Yeah, I've shown both, uh, not extensively. I had a couple of Brittany clients, Cole Weimaraner clients up here, and I enjoyed showing them. Weimaraners are a breed I think you have to almost let them do their own thing, but they still need your guidance because they need they need your support. <laughs> and I, I think that you need to be with them. Brittany's, well, uh, a Brittany, if you get a, a really good show dog, Brittany, you can go on forever. They, they just seem to enjoy it a lot. There's certain breeds that just enjoy it. Like Iris said, her males, oh, doesn't matter what's happening. You give them a smack on the butt and away they go. They're just, they're just thrilled. Now the girls, on the other hand, they think too much and they make you, they make you work. But the Iris said her boys. I guess you, like I, I find I find that with the boxers too. I don't know if you find that with the Dormans, but the boxer girls, it's almost like you've got a talk them into it where the boys are like okay <laughs> <laughs> oh I, I get a whole lot of things with boxers but I've, <laughs> it just I show a lot of boxers myself and the temperaments seem to be a challenge um as of late but that's not just boxers I see that in oh sure I showed for well. one boxer kennel basically so I got to know what to expect um, and the girls were all princesses and the boys were all just dumb boys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so how about, I have, um, Annie wants to know if you've shown an Atlantic um, sheepdog. Atlantic sheepdog? I can't say that I have. 
my really good buddy Doug Delter shows them all the time, but I don't think I've ever shown an Icelandic sheepdog. I've got a couple of juniors that have some of the rare breeds and um, a wire haired Gisla. Yeah, uh, we have those up here. I've never shown one either though. Uh, we have a couple of breeders up here that do very well with them. Um, they look, the, the one dog that was up here, he did very well. He looked like, looked like he was a fun dog to show. I don't think they're much like the smooths though in temperament. I think they're a little more, they seem a little more grounded than the smooths as far as when I watch them. So. Interesting. Well, I, so I'm going to, um, um, unmute the mics. So I am going to invite the juniors to come on and ask questions directly to Will. And it, it can be temperament questions, grooming questions, whatever you want to ask, um, please. Have some questions. questions. Raise your hand. Go ahead. What's your thoughts on showing black and tans? Black and tan. Coonhound. Oh, coon hounds. Okay. I, I, I've shown a couple of those. I, I had a client up here I showed coon hounds for. Um, I, again, they're hounds. So they, they do have their own. Um, they, they like to think, think them, themselves, I find. And you need to guide them a lot. And coon hounds need direction because they're easily distracted. And I, I find Ed Bivin taught me a lesson about certain breeds that a lot of these breeds we put them in unnatural positions. This isn't this isn't what they're meant to do as being show dogs. So they're doing it as a favor to us. And you watch certain breeds and coon hounds are one of them. You watch them in, when they're working in the field and they look striking. And sometimes you take that same striking dog and put it in a show ring and they're like, what the heck is this? And they can close up. You've got to bring that out and, uh, and make, make them feel like they are working. Those two breeds want to be working and they need a job and you've got to give them a, their job is being a show dog that day and you need to work with them that way. It's a great answer, Will. Um, we have some more questions here. Is it, this is a great resource for, for you junior. So questions would be great. Sam has his hand up, Sam. Um, is it impossible to show like a bull terrier, like a very strong breed is it impossible well, nothing's impossible <laughs> what's that i missed the question like in a best junior to get like a top win in juniors well i i think it takes an individual it depends on the bull on the bull we talk are we i guess i i think um no, I think if you work with that dog and you, and like I said, you, you meld with that dog, you can win with any breed. There are some handlers that show, um, like you, you think that a Pekingese is boring. Well, you watch David show them and David gets the most out of that breed and he's doing what he's supposed to do. And the real breeders and the real judges, they, they see it and they know exactly what he's doing. So I think if you become a breed specific handler that way, it doesn't really matter what breed you're showing as long as you show it how it's meant to be shown. Did that answer it at all, Sam? It's <laughs> a good question. I know. Um, Gosh. Who, who is? Because there's definitely some breeds that are more glamorous and tend to do more winning. But every breed has their own nuances and, and, and breed specific ways to show them. And, and a good judge or a good handler or a good breeder, they'll recognize that you're doing the right thing for that breed. It may not look as glamorous sometimes because some breeds aren't glamorous. But we can still be shown in the, in the, the original way they, they were meant to be shown. And that is a talent, I, I, I really know. Did. I was asked to help show a, it was a great Pyrenees and I've, I've shown a couple of them now, but the first time I was asked to show one, I, I always, if I don't know a dog or a handler is to go somewhere very quickly, I'll say, what do I need to do? What does this breed need? What's the temperament like? And the handler told me, just ignore it. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm a Doberman person, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. really hard for me, but you know, that whole, you know, very aloof, and not having that type of intensity. And that is a key with a great handler is being able to change that up 
And, you know, as Will said, being able to honor that breed and show proper breed temperament and presentation. I mean, it's a breed specific is a, is an important way to show dogs. It really is. You'll find a lot of, you know, I, I don't want to pick on anybody, but you'll see some young handlers show everything the same way. And when I was a kid, you, when golden retrievers were shown, they weren't shown with their ears up and their arch neck. They were shown like sporting dogs. So it was really hard for me to watch certain handlers show these goldens because it wasn't very breed specific. Well, now the tide is turning and a lot of handlers show them that way because it's become breed specific. But if you showed that way to an English judge or a Scottish judge where the breed originated, they wouldn't know what the heck you were doing. So, Yes, Annie. My new junior's dog is going to be a male Rottweiler. Um, and like, how would you keep like the, the breed, like how you show a Rottweiler, how would you keep that while also standing out in a junior's ring with a difficult dog? Well, you mean is, is the dog is physically difficult? Is he? Is he um, he's is huge he and he has opinions and he will tell you those opinions and we're working on not. Yeah. You, you've got to work with that dog in itself and work with him you're gonna have to you, you can you don't necessarily have to show off to do a good job right? but you have to work with that dog and get the best out of him without pushing the wrong buttons with that breed you, you don't want to you, you don't want to be intimidating in any way he, he needs to own the ground he walks on it and be confident but there's a fine line and you've got to find that line and stay with it and um it, it, again, it's a breed specific thing. You watch certain Rottweiler handlers and they'll get a lot out of dogs and they've got to be on, on, I, I give them, I take my hat off to them because I was never very good at Rottweilers because it was, it's an intimidating ring to be in sometimes just even to watch. Um, but the good ones, you don't notice the handler again, you notice the dog and they do such a good job and they don't let their dogs get into situations where the dog will, try to intimidate, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a breed that has that intimidation factor. I, I, and as a kid, I remember watching this one handler and he was, he used it to his, he used to air other handlers in the ring, the way he presented his dog. And it was too much. It was too over the top and it wasn't, it wasn't comfortable to watch as far as I was concerned. Then you watch someone like Brian still show a Rottweiler back in his heyday and bra you hardly even noticed him the dog looked beautiful so he worked the dog the way he thought it should be worked and i didn't notice brian much at all and, and it was it was fun to watch him show those dogs and he had some tough dogs like he asked he had this one dog he asked me to hold on to and it was a i can't believe how he made it look so easy and i was just holding the dog outside the ring for him and it was tough so he was just working he knew what dog he had and he worked with it and I will say, Annie, um, as someone, you know, having shown Doberman my whole life, and I have shown Roddy's as well, when you're showing breeds like that in junior showmanship, there will be times that you'll come across a judge that's going to be intimidated by your dog. Um, but if, if that's your breed and that's the breed that you love, just, just stick with it because there's also going to be um, times that there's going to be a Doberman or a Rottweiler person judging junior showmanship and that person that has a Pekingese or a toy poodle is going to say, oh, well, that working person isn't going to like my dog. So, so you're going to sometimes experience things in junior showmanship where perhaps a judge is intimidated by your dog. And as Will said, there are certainly are things training wise that you should be working on so that, that she or he is not talking so much because I, I know my Rottweiler friends go, oh, he's just talking. Well, people that aren't used to Rottweilers that talk, especially people that, you know, it, it can be very intimidating and scary. So if that's your breed, love it, work with it, understand that you're occasionally, you're going to come across people or a judge that you're just not going to win that day. It happens to me when I go into Best in Show, sometimes there are judges that they just don't like, they don't like Dobermans or they're not gonna like that breed. So don't um, give up or get frustrated because you have a Rottweiler and not everybody likes them. That, that's your breed, um, stick with it. 
and and do your best so they're they're not talking so much <laughs> under those other judges that don't understand well. Judge walks out there, and he's got, and they're going to recognize that you're showing that dog breed specifically, and you're going to be rewarded for it. So, stick to your guns. Just just don't don't. Uh, hey, there's that another beagle up there. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go to Amanda, who has a question next, and then we'll get to Olivia. I have a Saluki and. I was wondering like how to stand out more in juniors since I, I'll stack him and he just stands there. And I was like, how do you kind of stand out more? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right one to teach you to stand out more because I've always tried to teach the opposite. I think you want the dog to, um, again, it comes down to, to breed specific and ended like with a with a saluki they're supposed to be looking off into the distance so i used to always have my salukis and i would have them i would i would barely baited them i let them wander around with their headpiece wandering and as if they were looking off into the distance and i would hold their chin once in a while but a lot of it was a breed specific thing where i just let them do what they were meant to do and the people that recognize it they will recognize that he is or she is standing out I showed a bitch named Lucky, and quite often, when it was her turn to walk into the her individual exam in the group, I would let her walk up by herself. I would wait till the judge was was um, done with the dog ahead of them. I a lot of handlers already had their dogs set up and waiting for them, and I would wait for them to be done. Then I would let her walk into her position. I would stop her with her nose, and then I'd give them that look that I was ready because she usually was ready. You know, and that, now that took training. I had to teach her to walk into a forest for a square in the right position, but it came across very breed specific because it seemed very almost arrogant the way she walked into position and I would just stop her. It was always, 90% of the time she was, she stopped perfectly for me. The odd time I might have to correct one or two things. And that was another thing when I, when I, when I teach people to set their dogs up, I let, I, I call it the no fuss stack and it's controlling the dog's head and the spine and the, everything's straight. So even when you're fixing something, there's always an outline, but most of the time when dogs stop themselves, at least two legs are right and just fix the other two. Don't feel the need to have to fix all four. Work smarter, not harder. And if it's not broken, don't fix it. People will notice those things when you let the dogs do it themselves and you're just guiding and, and, and fixing what's wrong rather than crawling under there and changing the oil on all four legs, you know. Do you have a video, Will, of, of yeah. that? I, I have two video, three videos on my dog show tips YouTube channel called the No Fuss Stack. One's on the table, one's when, one's when I first started videoing, so it's like 15, 20 years ago, and it's been updated since, so there's a newer one as well. So, oh, Great. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. I, I know when I used to teach handling classes, I would call it the quick stack, and we would, I'd always have a competition at the end of class, and the they liked it to see how my my competition was who could touch the least amount of legs without exactly. um, it just walk a dog into a stack. I think that's a just a great skill for uh, for you to be able to work on when you don't have the time to to take all that time to stack yeah. up your dog. A lot of it is head control because you can guide them just the way the way you stop them, and then you look down and you just fix what's wrong. Don't fix all four. If it's not broken, don't fix it. I, I have a, my first exercise in every class I teach, because I teach classes on Wednesday, and I'm sure they all hate it, but I make them walk, I bring them all in, and I make the whole class march from corner to corner and stop and fix what's wrong until I feel they're ready to move on from that point. And it's amazing, and by the, by the second trip around, they're barely fixing anything because they figured it out. So. That's great. And did I lose, um, Olivia, do you still have a question? Did you have a question? Oh, yes. Um, I, I have a beagle, and he's going to be one in May. But he does not like his lip being held, like, to stack him. And I just was wondering if you had any tips for that. Like his lip being held? Yeah, like, um, and not, like, holding the collar, just his lip. He doesn't like it. I tend start when you start when you're setting them up is I tend to start gutting them with I let them rest their head right here on my and so they lean in the, into it and eventually they feel comfortable to lean into your hand then you slowly slide your hand to, to tuck everything in 
And that's how I, a lot of beagles are like that. A lot of beagles don't want to be told what to do. And I, so I sort of use this as a guide for their headpiece and guide them in, let them get comfortable and then close my hand around there. Not even grabbing their lip. I usually just grab their, around their trachea and their jawline and just grab that. Because I find if you grab it, it's like when someone grabs your arm, you're going to pull away. So I never grab their faces. I let them lean into my my hand more than anything else as a guide. So. <laughs> and I know what beagles can be like. Um, I have here a question from Elizabeth. Any tips when competing for best junior with a dachshund? With a dachshund? Well, again, it's, it's just a breed specific thing. And you just gotta, sometimes you just gotta hope that your judge is knowledgeable enough that they'll recognize what you're doing with that dachshund. Um, like I, I, I showed this Airedale bitch years ago and Bob Forsyth was judging and he gave her best in show. And I, she went best show the day after and I ran with that judge and walked with Bob. And I was just knowing what the judge is like. Now, Bob, if I ever ran with an Airedale with, under Bob, he would have yelled at me because that's not a really specific thing. But the judge that was judging the other day was more of a, not, I don't want to say generic all rounder, but that's what they were. And they were all, they were taking them by the flash. And, and so I moved her quicker and showed her more like a sporting dog where it was so wrong and under a real terrier person, I would have lost. But I think you just need to know your judges. You need to know how to present your dogs to certain judges. And a lot of the judges down there are handlers that have applied to judge handle, junior handling. So watch them show their dogs and see how they present their dogs. If they if they're tend to be a little over the top, well, then maybe you might have to step it up a little bit and put a little bit of flash into your game. But if they're handlers that show the dogs breed specifically, that's how you should show you. And you'd be surprised. They recognize it. They really do. They recognize what you're doing and they'll reward you if they feel you're doing a good job. Yeah, that's that's great advice. And I, a reminder I always um, say is doing your research. You know, as professional handlers, when we have judges coming up, uh, we look at judging panels to see who's going to be judging the breeds that we're going to be showing. And if we don't know those judges, before we walk into that ring, we ask, I wanna have a sense of what style to bring into the ring. You know, do I need to be, and I'm in Dobermans, do I need to be more aggressive? Do I need to, can I throw bait? Can I throw bait? What are their preferences going to be? And just as you need to adjust to different dog personalities, oftentimes you may need to adjust a little bit to who's, who's judging and what their preferences are. And, and like Will said, you know, some people might like a, a showier style. Um, and, you know, but not everybody is going to know breed specific. So um, knowing who your judges are and doing that research and then letting that help shape the decisions you make when you step into that ring. Yep, forewarned is forearmed, there's no question. <laughs> then I have a question from Drew. Any advice on how to get your dog ready and focused when waiting your turn to go into the ring? What do you do, Will? What I do is, I don't know if you've seen handlers when they have their dogs on wet towels outside the ring. There's, there's two reasons why they use that wet towel. A wet towel is to keep the dog cool and, and, and keep his pads moist so they don't slip in the ring. But I also feel it, that that's their spot. And that's like the batter's case. Or they know that once they leave that towel, they're going in the ring. And I never ever play with my dog or work my dog outside the ring because I don't want them to think that that's more fun than being in the ring. Like you'll often see a dog and they, someone will be working outside the ring, they'll be, oh, we're working, we're working. And as soon as they cross that line to go in the ring, the dog changes. And usually the dog changes because you change, because you become more anxious because you've walked into that ring. So it's gotta be more, it's gonna be a lot more cooler and smooth. And I tend to just let my dog stand there and I keep, a, I'm, I'm aware of everything around. I don't let anybody get in the way of my dog or interfere with my dog. Uh, and you've got to have eyes in the back of your head because sometimes dogs see things that we don't see. So you need to be a, have your attention on your dog. It's like I, I've shown a lot of um, bloodhounds. And when you, when uh, Tommy Glassford always said that bloodhounds see ghosts that we don't see. Well, a lot of breeds are, are have that 
they're not used to being in places so they see things that we don't see you've got to be aware of that and you need you need to be on top of that because sometimes if they see something they're not comfortable with and if you let it sink into their head too long you'll never get them back for that for that time in the ring you've got to be aware of what's happening so when i have my dogs at ringside they are they sit they sit on their stand on their wet towel which has become their their warm up spot and i'm basically I'm, I'm talking to them and encouraging them, but I'm not forcing them to do anything. I'm not playing with them. I'm not beating them. Everything I, anything I do fun, beat wise, work wise is in that ring. Outside the ring, they're in their spot and they know what's next. It's all structure based. So that's, that's how I make sure the dogs are focused. Miss P, when I showed Miss P, I always had an assistant holder and I stood right in front of her and I just spoke to her the whole time before it was our turn to go in the ring. I didn't bait her, I didn't do anything. Sometimes she spoke back to me and she would woof at me, but we, I, I always had her focus. And then when we walked in the ring, that's when she, she knew it was time to turn on. Great. Uh, so I have a question from a parent. I would love to see uh, parents here participating as well. <laughs> It's from Sam. Uh, it says, Will, as someone who has mentored several young people, do you have any do's or don'ts or advice for junior parents? Anything you think is great to do or not so great? Well, it's a fine line again. I don't like the parents to be too pushy with them. Then you see some some handlers or some parents, I almost said owners, <laughs> some parents become total what we call up here hockey parents. I don't know what they call them down there where they just push, 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 and they want them. I, I find that becomes too hard on the, there's too much pressure on the, on the kids. Then I, I like, I like to encourage them and again, seek help for them. If they, if they have a question for you that you can't answer, well, then I might go find the answer. Like Jamie, my oldest boy, he was a junior handling lot and he hated when I went to watch junior handling. But he loved it when my friend, another handler, was there because he would ask him questions where he wouldn't ask me questions because I was his dad, I suppose. But um, just encouragement, listening and being encouraging. And, and if they need help, give them help and give them guidance. Point them in the right direction. Don't push them, though. Don't push. And Sam, I, I believe you're new to this as well, so welcome. Um, and I, I do make myself available on Messenger or Facebook. So if you would like to um, Facebook friend me, and I believe Will said that he would be available as well. So if you would like to friend request either one of us as you're trying to make decisions as to some of the do's or the don'ts, um, feel free to reach out to us as, and then probably as time goes on, you'll, you'll get to know some other parents as well. Yeah, no, thank you. It's my, it's our first, you know, he's nine and it's our first juniors experience. Um, and it's, it's a different world than the normal dog show breed stuff. So we're learning that, like you said, some parents that are very intense parents. Yeah. Uh, and we're kind of like trying yeah. to walk the line between being encouraging and like not crazy. Right. There's a fine line. <laughs> Yeah, so, and just making the right choices. You know, I know my son has kind of like got his heart set on this difficult dog. We've been told like several times, like just bag the dog, find another dog, you know, and he really wants that dog. So it's like, we're like, as parents, do we make it easy for him? Do we let him struggle? I mean, it's, you know, we're trying. <laughs> you know, they don't give a book with it. Like, uh, up. A lot of times they would just ask a handler if they could show certain dogs. And I would be judging and I would see them walk in the ring with a dog that was multiple best in show winner and knew exactly what they were doing. And, and I don't think they're really learning anything that way. So I think they need, they need some adversity when they're showing dogs and they need to learn how to, how to, how, what the, what the, um, how that dog becomes that show dog. They need to learn how that happens. I'll just be given a show dog that's a wind up toy and away they go. So you don't learn anything that way. I don't think they're fun to show, <laughs> but. Yeah. And I would also like to say um, that, you know, the dog show environment can be very challenging. People are very, very pushy. So you will, you will learn. One thing you will learn a lot about is boundaries and how to set boundaries 
who you want to associate with, who it's healthy for you, what works for you and what doesn't. And there may be some people that maybe they mean well and they're being very helpful, um, but as it turns out, all of their advice isn't helping you and, and maybe you need to just step back. So you will, you will learn a lot at dog shows. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a, a question here from Elliot. And Elliot says that he has a standard schnauzer puppy who is getting ready for his first show. And he wants to know how to prepare him when he shows him alone, because of when he's alone, he does perfect. But the moment he sees a person, he gets so excited and cannot stand still. Yeah, a lot of the, I, I see that a lot. And a lot of the times, because they have this behavior, we anticipate it. So we tend to promote it for them. They know that you're expecting it. Um, I, I think you need to slow things down. Like George said, work in half speed and just do things in a slow motion manner with that dog. And it's become, it's gotta become a structured thing for him because he's, he's gets himself so excited when he sees other dogs or other people and he he feels your reaction. So I just think it, you've got to learn to work through it and work things slow, one thing at a time. Even I tell people with new dogs in my classes, if you get two legs right tonight, I'll be really happy, you know? So sometimes that's the case with these dogs, but a lot of the times it's how they react to you. They know how, they know, that you're expecting it and, and they get, they pent up. It becomes, the two of you are becoming one, but almost in the wrong way because he's feeling what you're feeling because you're getting anxious for that, that moment to happen. And I see it a lot of times with when dogs have bad experiences in the ring, like say they have a bad experience with a dog with a judge looking in their mouth. Well, then that handler expects that every time and he starts to anticipate it. I, you've almost got to blank that slate every time you walk in the ring so that you're not expect you don't overreact and cause that dog to do those things it's, it's, again it's yeah, and, sorry go ahead and i will say as well as you know someone who's won many best in shows me personally there's nothing more nerve-wracking than walking in the ring with that six-month-old puppy that you have spent all this time training and you just want this perfect performance and and so that you, when you create this expectation, you just, it, it, it doesn't help. So, so all I'm trying to say is Elliot, I completely understand how you have been practicing and everything is so perfect. Um, but one of the big things that I always tell myself is let's just, let's just, let's just get this one behind us. And I try to just let some of that pressure go, have the expectation, that he's a puppy and he's probably is going to want to greet that judge and that's okay. In time, he will settle down. And I think the more that you can just allow for the fact that he's a puppy, he's gonna be excited. And there's, if, if it were me personally and I was guiding him through that experience, I might, of course, I would want to be very calm. And when it was all over, I would probably want to very calmly let him know that that was okay. So even if he moved, he did a bunch of just, that was okay. It wasn't amazing, but we'll say that was okay. You know, that, that was a start, you were excited and and that's okay, it's a good first step. So so being able to maybe rein back your expectations for, for what you expect of him and know that, you know, he, he's a puppy and you he probably will move. And if he does, it's okay, you guys will get there. That's where we start. Yeah. So. And do we have any other questions here? Any more questions? No. No. So I mean, that that's. Uh, I think we're ready to draw this to a close. It was just a fabulous session. Well, I thank you so much for your time. I enjoyed myself spending the, spending the evening with you guys. It was fun. I love I love this kind of environment. So. Thank you. And, and you can look Will up for those of you that don't know him. It's Will Alexander and your, is it willalexander.net? Okay, dot net and uh, my channel is dog show tips. Dog show tips. Yeah. So a great thing to do if you're driving to the dog shows, you're at a show and you, you have some time, check out Will Alexander's dog show tips. A lot of things, a lot of my interviews are on podcasts now too. So you can do that while you're driving. Great. 
Yeah, that's what, great. What's the name of the podcast? And the name of the podcast is? Dog Show Tips as well. Yeah. Dog okay. Show Tips. Okay.